mystic powers antarayan vadanti eta yunjato yoga uttamam maya sampadya manasya kalakshapana hetavah so here <coughs> it is being told that mystic powers are something which is an impediment on the path of bhakti and therefore devotees do not desire this so i'll speak this in three main points first i'll speak about how mystic powers are extraordinary in degree not in category they are extraordinary in degree not in category second point i'll talk about how to utilize anything in bhakti we need to deglamorize it first deglamorize it and third point i'll talk about how our desire for the resources to serve krishna should never become greater than the desire to serve krishna so let's begin with the first point that mystic perfections are extraordinary in degree not in category mystic perfections or <coughs> yogic siddhis as they are called in sanskrit they are what intrigue many people and <coughs> i just uh, when i was in america i was at a prominent university in princeton they had a whole center for paranormal studies and paranormal studies means is there is telepathy some people can read each other they can communicate at the level of the mind there is psychokinesis psychokinesis means that somebody just looks at a glass and say a person desire that the lid start moving and the lid starts moving without even touching it so psychokinesis kinesis is motion psycho is with the mind so now these are at one level dismissed in the mainstream scientific world view as impossible and the specific mystic siddhis which the vedic scriptures talk about they are we won't go into specifics but the principle is the mystic siddhis they are similar that where what is physically not possible is possible for some people and while there has been a huge amount of skepticism about the possibility of any such paranormal things happening but there is a significant amount of evidence for uh, what these are called as psi so one well documented experiment is called as a staring experiment staring experiment means that say if we are sitting somewhere and we get a sensation somebody is staring at me and we look back and then we may see that person is looking at us and the person they will become a little embarrassed and looks away so anybody who is a little attractive may have this experience of people staring now in general everybody has some kind of sense by which oh somebody is staring at me you look back so the scientists did an experiment that normally if somebody is sitting behind you and you have to guess staring at you or not staring at you so the possibility of you coming right is 50% the two possibilities now in general everyone guess gets around 60% right some people even get 95% right there's one person who has got 100% right now there is just no way we don't have any eyes in the back of our head so how do we come to know so people say maybe when we look at someone from the eye certain magnetic fields are radiated and that are sensed by the brain if we try to reduce it down to some physical mechanism it is very difficult but studies like these where we seem to have a capacity to sense something more than what we can sense with our normal senses so that is called as paranormal and how uh, how does this paranormal work at the level of physicalism physicalism is that modern science which says that physical reality is the only reality there is just no explanation for this also uh, most of the times what people do is skeptics they just dismiss this as bad data this is bad data this is not proper observation but as one researcher has said now the bad data if it accumulate together it has become like a himalayan mountain now 
So he says, to dismiss so much data as bad data, actually you have to become blind. So there is a significant amount of evidence. Now, not everybody has this, but there, is, there are a good number of people who have these kind of things. In fact, <clears throat> during the Cold War between the <clears throat> Soviet bloc and the Western bloc, US, USA and USSR, this psychic warfare was used quite frequently. Devamrut Maharaj, in searching for Vedic India, that book gives quite a bit of evidence of psychic warfare use, being used by both Western and the Eastern uh, intelligence, uh, intelligence agencies. Anyway, so the point I was making here is that what the scriptures talk about, something similar has been documented, although it is not explained by modern science. <clears throat> However, if we look at this, the, while the, our scriptures talk a lot about it, they don't glamorize it. Like here it is said, it's an impediment. So what, what is it? How does this happen? Actually, we all have some sensory capacity. Say, for example, uh, we all have some cent uh, central vision. Say, I'm looking at you. I can look at you. That is the focus. But while looking at you, I'm also aware, OK, there's a picture over here. This is a picture of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu in Jagannath Puri or whatever. So we also have peripheral vision. Now, some people's peripheral vision is very less. Some people's peripheral vision is very high. So as much as they can see front, they can see peripherally also. So now this is just a matter of degree. It's somebody has a high peripheral vision, that's just a matter of degree. It's not something special. So if somebody has rear vision, by which they can see if somebody from behind is staring at them, that is a, just a further extension of this degree. So category means it's something just, oh, how can anyone do like this? But so degree means, says, uh, ordinary people may have, say, vision if we say 20%. If it's arbitrary percentage you take, extraordinary people may have 60%. So some people may have 100%. So with respect to speaking also, there are some people who can just speak so mesmerizingly, just captivate people. So some people might be able to speak stammeringly, some people speak mesmerizingly. Some people speak, not just mess, they hypnotize their audience. There are cases where some people can speak in such a way that person whom they're speaking to just take out the wallet and give it to And people can rob like that. There are, the there are people who are sweet talkers. So now we understand this is, not ex this is extraordinary, but it's extraordinary in degree. It is not extraordinary in category. Category means it belongs to some other category itself. So why is it important to understand that it's just a difference in degree, not category? Uh, that it is a matter of degree means that just as all of us have done different karma in the past, by which we have different resources right now. So similarly, just as some people have very fluent speaking capacity, some people have just a little bit of mediocre speaking capacity. That we understand is because of past karma. So similarly, by past karma, some people may have certain abilities to an extraordinary degree. So even with respect to hypnosis, when somebody tries to hypnotize someone else, I was, at a, <clears throat> was with a devotee in America, uh, and in UK, and he told me that he learned hypnotic regression, and whenever he gives a class on you are not the body, you are the soul, he actually does mass hypnosis for all the audience and takes them, hypnotically regresses them back to his previous life. And he actually gives them demonstration. Now he said that on a one-to-one -one level, if I do hypnosis, my success is almost 90, 95%. When I do mass hypnosis, the success is around 60-65%. Because you know you have to catch the attention of the audience and you have to make people's mind go backwards. And <clears throat> uh, there's one senior devotee, he is a prominent leader in our moment, the Guru and Sanyasi, he said that he has learned this past life hypnotic regression therapy just to preach to people. And now he has said he has almost made 50 devotees uh, by just taking people to hypnotic regression. Through hypnotic regression, you give them demonstration, you remind them of their previous lives. Now here, what is happening? 
See, just as if somebody is very receptive, when we are talking with someone, normally we don't open the doors of our hearts to people. But if somebody is very receptive, very appreciative, very open, we may start sharing our heart, we may start telling, oh, you know, when I was a child, this happened to me. When I was a youth, this happened to me. And as we tell the events of our past, even certain memories which might have been buried, they come up. Whenever somebody tries to write an autobiography or a biography. Recently, one devotee and senior leader, he asked me whether I could write his biography. So I was discussing with him. And then we found that actually, to write a biography, there is a specialist professional who actually asks questions to people. And you can get specialist training for that. So you dredge the memory. So okay, when you are five, when you are three, when you are 10, when you are 15, there is so much stored in our memory which we are not aware of. So it's like our memory, uh, if we consider a laptop, the laptop's hard laptop screen is like our conscious memory. But all the data that is stored in the laptop, in the drive, that is like the unconscious memory or the subconscious memory. So just as if we do some search appropriately, then we might find a file which we are not used for 15 years also. So now this capacity to recollect things from the past, or the capacity to get others to recollect something from the past, this is just an ability. Even with Google searching, some people are very expert at searching. Now, if we search on something, we might not find some information, and somebody else searches the same Google search, but they know how to put the parameters, what to search, and they come up with a lot of data. So now, if we are not able to find something, when we search, and somebody else finds, now that's extraordinary, but it's extraordinary in degree, not in category. They're using the same Google engine, search engine. So like that, this is the ability to remember the past, this also some people may have extraordinary ability. But it's extraordinary in degree, not in category. So all these mystics of these, they're extraordinary, no doubt. But they're extraordinary just in degree. Just all of us have this ability to some extent, but some people have it much, much more than others. And so this was the first point. Now we may often get this question, the second point is, that before we can use something in bhakti, we need to de-glamorize it. What does that mean? Say, so if we hear about mystic siddhis, nowadays we may feel that we, to attract people to Krishna and Krishna's message is so difficult. If somebody had some special powers, we could use that to attract people to Krishna. So there's a Prabhupada disciple who is a, who is a professional ma magician. Mm, so he's the president of a temple in America. And he says he does magic shows. And I was talking with him, he said that he tried doing magic shows as a way to get people to Krishna. And he's done it in quite creative ways. But he told me that I have found that the people who come for magic shows and the people who come for Krishna consciousness, they're almost like two non-intersecting categories. <laughs> so, you can do magic shows and people are attracted. You can get a lot of people. But after some time, they're interested in magic shows only. They don't become interested in Krishna. And he said he tried to do some, he said that once like he had a show with three, three threads and he entangled them and disentangled them and made them disappear. He tried to explain three modes of material nature through that. And he said that actually what happened is for entertainment to be entertaining, it has to be fast. And when you try to explain any philosophical concept, people get lost. So in general, although mystics, any extraordinary powers may be very useful for attracting people. But often the people who are attracted are not the people who are really going to be attracted to Krishna. So now it is possible that there might be a small intersection. But how much is that intersection that can vary from person to person? And say some people might be very humorous in their classes. And now everybody, almost there's nobody who will say, I don't like humor. People love humor. And people, thousands of people may be attracted through humor. Now, from those thousands, if you see how many will get attracted to Krishna, that will vary from person to person. 
And so some people may have, if somebody has the capacity for humor, wonderful. Somebody has the capacity for magic, wonderful. Somebody has the capacity for uh, something like that. And if they can use it, it's wonderful. But whoever is attracted towards that is not necessarily attracted towards Krishna or very rarely attracted towards Krishna. It's interesting, so I was talking with a professor in Princeton where this, uh, they have these paranormal studies. And he said, the way we were able to fund, get this department funded uh, and sanctioned was by completely uh, disconnecting it from any religion of any kind. So they said that when they did this, they had to say specifically that we are not going to talk about God. Nothing, we, this is only a scientific study. So basically, uh, although people are interested in paranormal, we may say, oh, if somebody develops some faith in the paranormal, so all these mystic siddhis are real, they might become more open-minded, and then they might be open to a higher spiritual reality. It's possible. So there's physical reality, there's mental reality, and there's spiritual reality. Mm -hmm. So, now, people who live simply at the physical level, if they understand that there is something more, that basically science is a very powerful tool to manipulate a small portion of reality. It's like we, are, we can go in a train super fast, but the train is inside a tunnel. And so science takes us faster and faster, but it takes us faster and faster inside a tunnel that never ends. So what happens, the tunnel vision is that physical reality is the only reality. So we may progress, but we stay within that paradigm. So some people, it might be, oh, there is something more than physical, there is mental. Oh, okay, that's good. Then maybe there's spiritual also. So now mystic siddhis, whether it is of the Vedic kind or what is described by science, and there, there's a lot of similarity between the two, they are basically mental phenomena. They are not spiritual phenomena. What do I mean by mental phenomena? The, if the soul is here, the mind is here, the body is here. So normally the soul's consciousness comes through the mind, through the body, to the outer world. So right now I'm looking at you. So I as the soul, I'm looking through the mind to you. And you are looking at me. So normally, the soul's consciousness comes to the mind, requires to come through the physical senses to perceive the outer world. But in some cases, those people, their consciousness, when it comes from the soul through the mind, it doesn't have to come through the physical senses. So the, actually, the brain is not the producer of consciousness. The brain is the limiter of consciousness. It's like, say, if there was a small, if somebody was in a ship, or we are in a plane, plane might be more common for most of us, if we are in a plane, and the plane has a small window. Now all that we can see outside is through that window. Now if, we, if the whole plane were transparent, then we could see the whole vast sky. But the windows is what we can, the only thing through which we can see the outer world. So similarly for the soul, the senses are like windows. Now, if we sit in the economy class or if we sit in the business class, sometimes in the business class there are bigger windows. Or somebody said there are elite flights. There is. Some people might make a flight which is, make a plane, which is a lot of glass around it. So you can get a 360 degree vision of the sky while you are flying. So what is there in the same plane, but their field of vision is expanded. So similarly, for some people, the soul, the mind and the senses. So for them, when the consciousness comes out through the mind, it is not limited to the senses. Their field of vision is expanded. So the mind can connect with the physical reality without the channel of the senses. Or the mind has a greater capacity to connect with the physical reality without being restricted only to the senses. And that is the essential way by which all mystic powers work. That normally the connection is between the soul, the mind, the senses, and then the body, then the physical reality. But in some cases, some people can connect with the physical reality without the medium of the senses. Say, Prapti Siddhi, Prabhupada would talk about it. And somebody can just stretch their hands, and suddenly, maybe some dates from the Middle East come in their hands. 
hey, how did it come? So normally at the physical level, we are limited. But if the mind can connect with the physical reality without needing the senses, then it will move much faster. And it will reach much further. So this is fascinating. Now one extreme could be people are skeptical and don't get attracted to it at all. They say this is not possible. But I discuss, there is evidence for it. So then some people may get attracted to it. And they may get so captivated by it that, okay, how does the mind interact with the physical reality in such ways? It's fascinating. It could be fascinating, but somebody may get so fascinated by that that they may never ascend to the spiritual level. So then, if we are so caught in something, if we are so captivated by something, then it cannot be used in Krishna's service. So for something to be utilized, it has to be first de-glamorized. De-glamorized means we can't be so captivated by it. Either the speaker or the performer or the audience. If they are so captivated by it, then that is so glamorous for them that they can't see Krishna. They can't, they can't perceive anything more than this. So it can be a tool, like I talked about um, <clears throat> these devotees in the West who are using hypnotic regression to get people uh, to accept the existence of the soul. But it's interesting, I wrote a book on the reincarnation in which I did not go into hypnotic regression memories because they are not reliable, very reliable. Because when you take people into the past, how do you know whether what they are experiencing is a memory or it's an imagination? It's very difficult to know. So I, serious scientists don't rely so much on hypnotic regression. They rely on spontaneous past life memories. So like a child suddenly says, Mommy, Mommy, I want to go to my other mommy. Says, what? So spontaneously, without any probe, any prompt, they start speaking. So I wrote the whole book on reincarnation, but after that I did some further research that how many of these children who remembered the past lives actually became interested in spirituality? And it's practically no one. They had a memory, oh, I was there in the past, but they, they, I was there in a previous life, and yes, I'll be there in a future life. But that itself did not make them spiritual at all. So that's why this whole point of any extraordinary ability, if it can be used in Krishna's service, that is good. But if it captivates people so much that it distracts them from Krishna, then it becomes a problem. The Srimad Bhagavatam is spoken to a person who is about to die. And at that point, everything other than Krishna is a distraction. So that's why Tasmad Ekena Manasa Bhagavan Sata Tampati Shrotavya Kirti Tavya Chadeya Pujas Chanityada Ekena Manasa with one pointed intelligence, use it in Krishna's service. You fix the mind on Krishna basically. So at that point, everything other than Krishna is a distraction, and that is the mood with which the Bhagavatam presents us Parabhakti or Kevala Bhakti, pure devotion, unalloyed devotion. So the as long so then I'll come to third point now. That I said that as long as something we are we think it is very attractive, it is fascinating, then it will distract us from Krishna. But can we use certain extraordinary abilities that we have in Krishna's service? Or can we seek to develop certain abilities by which we can serve Krishna better? Yes, we can, definitely. But there is a purpose and there is a means to a purpose. So our desire for the means to the purpose should never become stronger than the desire for the purpose. That means, let's say if we want to become attracted towards Krishna, we want to become develop love for Krishna. Now for that, we might want certain abilities, we might want singing ability, speaking ability, managing ability, whatever, so many abilities. And some devotees may have them in phenomenal capacities. Now we may say, let me get this. And yes, whatever we, it is our goal that we want to become as versatile and as malleable an instrument in the hands of our Guru and Krishna. Versatile means we have many, many abilities that we can use in Krishna's service. Malleable means that whichever service we are told to do, we are ready to do that. So we want to become as versatile and as malleable as possible. At the same time, sometimes 
we may start desiring a particular resource for serving Krishna. And we may get so captivated by that. So enamored by that. So desirous of that, that that can distract us from Krishna. Prabhupada writes in the Kapila section, when Karda Muni actually has a darshan of Krishna, and, uh, uh, there he says, a devotee desires to see Krishna, but a devotee doesn't demand to see Krishna. So if you don't desire, then where is the devotion? Naturally, a devotee desires to have darshan of Krishna. But if we demand, then again, how are we the servants of Krishna? We desire, but we don't demand. And that is the mood which we can have when we are seeking some resource for serving Krishna. So, many times devotees become discouraged while practicing bhakti and discouragement uh, can degenerate into depression and <clears throat> when this happens, quite often it is not so much because they feel that oh, I, thought, I was told that when you practice bhakti you will become happy but actually I am not happy at all I am feeling disheartened, I am feeling depressed Does this bhakti work? Now, it could have many different reasons, but one reason could be that while practicing bhakti, we have become very strongly obsessed with certain goals other than Krishna in bhakti. And not getting those goals is what is causing us discouragement. So if somebody desires, okay, I am doing this program and I want to make say, 30 devotees in one month or one year. If that is more reasonable. And then you find that some other devotees are able to make 50 devotees in one year. And I have been preaching for three years and not even 30 devotees I made. So we may become disheartened by that. At one level, it is just normal human to want to do something tangible and the inability to do something tangible may dishearten us. But at the same time, our service to Krishna is dependent primarily or, or is meant primarily to connect us with Krishna. So, so we are here, Krishna is here. And what happens is our service is meant to connect us with Krishna. Now while doing the service, we may connect various things and various people with Krishna also. Why if we are, say if somebody is building a temple. Then what are they doing? They are actually, trans they, tra they are connecting that area, that resource, that place with Krishna by manifesting a beautiful temple over there. Now that is important, but the most important is to connect oneself with Krishna. When we are preaching, we want to connect others with Krishna through our preaching, but the most important thing is we want to connect ourselves with Krishna. And if we forget this primary thing that I am meant to connect myself with Krishna, and you become so caught in the secondary, you know, I, have to, I have to get these people to Krishna, I have to do this project for Krishna. It's important to do projects, it's important to uh, connect people with Krishna. But that can't be allowed to become so important for us that inability to do that disheartens us and we stop trying to connect with Krishna ourselves. So often when we become disheartened, it is because, not because we have lost the facility to connect with Krishna. Krishna is always available with us. But certain resources we wanted to get for Krishna, those we may not be able to get for Krishna. So, in bhakti, we want to make various offerings for Krishna. Just like in cooking, we might want to cook some delicious item for Krishna. Now, it's important that we make the best offering, whether it is giving a class, or building a temple, or building, helping build a community, or whatever it is. We want to make the best offering for Krishna. But for Krishna, the best offering is not what we offer, but we ourselves. In bhakti, we don't just make the offering, we are ourselves the offering. We are ourselves the offering. And if we, if we get so caught in making an offering to Krishna, and the inability to make us makes us irritable, uh, resentful, angry, disheartened, then what is happening? Neither are we offering that to Krishna, nor are we offering ourselves to Krishna. And thus we end up getting disconnected from Krishna. So, Tesham Satat Yuktanam Bhajatam Preeti Purvakam. That Bhakti Sivapam Preeti Purvakam.
It is to be performed with an affectionate disposition towards Krishna. And if we strive to make sure that we have that affectionate disposition, we'll find that Krishna will guide us. Dami buddhi yogam tam yena mamupayantite. He will give us the intelligence of how much to strive for what. So yes, if to do anything for Krishna, we have to strive. So if you want to develop a particular ability, whether it is singing ability, musical ability, speaking ability, managing ability, whatever ability, it requires effort to develop that ability, no doubt. And we need to put in that effort also. But we have to have a proper sense of perspective. And that perspective is the buddhi yoga, the dhami buddhi yogam tam. How much to endeavor for what? And how much to focus on Krishna? That intelligence Krishna will give us if we make sure that we do our bhakti priti purvakam. If we do our devotion in a mood of affection towards Krishna. Then, even if we are not able to offer many big things to Krishna, but still we will offer our hearts to Krishna. So mystic perfections can be very powerful, very captivating, very extraordinary sources by which we can do something wonderful for Krishna, we can attract people towards Krishna. And in our particular few areas, we might want to develop some, some special abilities. And we can seek to develop them, but if we become so captivated with them, that they distract us from Krishna. Then what is said over here? They will become impediments. They will, instead of taking our, our consciousness towards Krishna, they will, they will block our consciousness. I'll conclude with one metaphor. Say if we are here, and we want to go, this, we want to go towards Krishna. Now while going towards Krishna, <coughs> we may want certain resources that may enable us to go faster or that may enable us to take others with us. So sometimes we might take a detour. Okay, this is a route, but I take this detour so that I can get this and I can move towards Krishna. Now Krishna is so expert that through the detour also Krishna can take us towards him. But the mind is so subtle or so cunning, you could say, sinister, that what is a detour slowly will become a U-turn. First it becomes a detour and then it becomes a U-turn, U-turn, U-turn. And most people who go away from bhakti, very, very rare are the people who are reasoned out of bhakti. That means they find certain philosophical points unreasonable. I just can't accept this. In the West I meet many devotees who were practicing bhakti and are now practicing bhakti at various degrees, not so seriously. So when I ask them what happened, practically less than a 0.1% people are those who said the philosophy stopped making sense to me no it was they didn't they know very few people are reasoned out of bhakti most people drift out of bhakti drift out means you start doing one thing instead of straight path you go take a detour and then a little bit more of the detour little bit more of the detour little bit more of the detour and then eventually it becomes a u turn and becomes a U-turn, that person just goes away from Krishna. And they don't even realize, hey, what happened? How did I go away from Krishna? So this is how, if we keep, if we stay in the association of devotees, we hear Krishna Katha regularly, and we keep the sense of perspective by that. My most important purpose is to connect myself with Krishna. And for connecting myself with Krishna, I can have certain resources, I will seek them. For connecting others with Krishna, if I need some service, resources, I can seek them. So I may desire them, but I will not demand them. I will not become disheartened if I don't get them. If I get them, wonderful, I'll use them. If I don't get them, still I will serve Krishna to the best of my capacity. When we have that mood, then we will find that Krishna is always available for us. Even if the world's recognition is not available for us, that doesn't matter that much. You know. The appreciation we get for our service is not as important as the absorption we get in our service. We do a service and people appreciate, oh, what a wonderful service. That's the appreciation we get. And it's good if we get it. We get, it can encourage us, it can enliven us. But the more important thing is the absorption we get in our service. So if you get that absorption, that absorption will be a steady connection and that will take us towards Krishna.
So I'll summarize. I spoke on the, broadly the theme of utilizing extraordinary abilities in Krishna's service. So first point I said is that <clears throat> when we are practicing bhakti, at that time, <clears throat> the extraordinary the mystic siddhis are extraordinary in degree, not in category. Like some people can see, have a large peripheral vision. Some people can have a real vision also. That is extraordinary, but in degree. Some people can rem remember about their childhood without being prompted very vividly. Some people may remember their past lives. No, that is extraordinary, but again, it is the same in degree, not in, not in category. So science also has evidence for PSI, for paranormal phenomena, which are similar to what the Vedic Siddhis are. But the important thing is that <clears throat> such things are not in themselves spiritual. They are, they are mental. Normally, the mind connects with the body or the physical reality through the senses. But for some people, the mind is, doesn't need the senses. The mind directly affects the, sense, uh, the physical reality. That is the essence of how mystic powers work. And before we can use anything in Krishna's, utilize anything in Krishna's service, we need to de-glamorize it. So if people who are attracted by certain mystical, perform extraordinary performances, a magic show or humor or certain abilities, whether they will get attracted to Krishna or not, that is something just to be carefully seen. And uh, when, we, are, when, when we, we glamorize some abilities, that means we get so captivated by it that we think that itself is the most important thing in our life. And as long as something is glamorous in our eyes, then that will take our eyes away from Krishna. And <clears throat> if anything distracts us from Krishna, that is an impediment. The last point I talked about is, if you want to use some extraordinary ability in Krishna's service, we can strive to develop it, but, but we can desire it, but not demand it. Our desire for that thing should not become so much that it becomes greater than our desire for Krishna. In trying to connect with things and with people, you, to connect them with Krishna, we shouldn't forget to connect ourselves with Krishna. We don't just want to make wonderful offerings to Krishna, we want to make ourselves an offering to Krishna. Make, we are the offering to Krishna. So, if we can practice bhakti without getting disheartened, resentful, irritable, because of certain inabilities in certain areas, then we will, if we stay preeti purvakam, if we stay devotionally disposed, then Krishna will give us the intelligence. How much to endeavor for what? And that way, if along the path of bhakti we need to take a detour, we can take it. But we won't, if we are guided by Krishna, if we stay connected with Krishna, then the detour won't become a U-turn. The appreciation we get in our service is not as important as the absorption we get in our service. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. So, there's no time for questions. It's already 9.30. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna.